Hello and welcome to the News 9 Plus show on the world's first news and current affairs OTT platform, News 9 Plus. I'm Aditya Raj Kaul. Prime Minister Narendra Modi met US President Joe Biden and attended the Quad Leaders Summit in the Wilmington, Delaware on Saturday as part of his three-day visit to the United States, underlining that the Quad Leaders are meeting at a time when the world is surrounded by conflicts and tension, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said that the grouping was not against anybody. This is seen as aimed at China's aggressive behavior in the Indo-Pacific. With an eye on China, the joint statement said, as leaders, we are steadfast in our conviction that international law, including respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity and the maintenance of peace, safety, security and stability in the maritime domain underpin the sustainability, development and prosperity on the Indo-Pacific. We emphasize the importance of adherence to international law, particularly as reflected in the United Nations Conviction on the Law of the Sea to address challenges to the global maritime rules-based order, including with respect to maritime claims. We are seriously concerned about the situation in the East and South China Seas. In an answer to the reporter's question on the future of the court after November 5th, U.S. election, Biden said that it would go way beyond November before the four leaders erupted in laughter. Biden patted the shoulder of Prime Minister Modi while giving the answer to the media about who will be, in fact, taking the court forward. India will be hosting the next court summit in 2025. Meanwhile, while addressing the two-day United Nations summit of the future conference, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said that peace was contingent on the reform of global institutions. The Prime Minister also called for reforms in the global institutions pointing to the African Union's new G20 membership as an example of progress. For global peace and development reforms in global institutions are necessary. Reform is the path to reverence, he said. How successful is the Quad grouping to contain China? And will there ever be a consensus on the UN reforms? These are the two questions that we are in fact asking here on the News 9 Plus show. And joining me to discuss this further, our Ambassador Meera Shankar, former Indian Ambassador to USA. We also have Dr. Sriparna Patak, Associate Professor of International Politics, OP Jindal Global University. And finally, Dr. Swasti Rav, Associate Fellow, MPIDSA. Thank you very much. You know, I must admit, I'm really, really happy that I have an all-woman panel here because the next debate that I'm doing is on women. But Dr. Ambassador uh, Shankar, if I can come to you, uh, first, you know, how do you see the recent meetings that have taken place, uh, you know, in the United States, especially the Quad, not happening in Delhi, but in fact in Delaware? Uh, is this merely aimed at domestic political concerns that Biden may have in the run-up to the elections? Or do you see a larger picture uh, of a specific theme vis-a-vis uh, -vis China uh, as we, of course, are looking towards hosting Quad next year? Look, I think that for President Biden, this would have been his last quad meeting um, since he will hand over the baton uh, in January next year. That's right. Uh, so I think it was an important uh, occasion because he signaled the importance that he attaches to the quad as a grouping which plays an important role in the Indo-Pacific. Mm -hmm. The quad lists as its objective, you know, promoting a and preserving uh, a free, open and prosper and inclusive uh, and prosperous Indo-Pacific. Uh, and in this process, uh, it has tried to define its role because it's not specifically a military alliance, mm -hmm. but does deal with issues of non-conventional security such as climate change or maritime security uh, response to natural disasters uh, you know uh, re uh, uh, ensuring the reliability of supply and diversified supply chains particularly in the areas of critical technology and looking at uh, global health issues, including pandemics. So there is a range of issues on which the Quad is cooperating. In this meeting, I think some important decisions were taken. 
particularly with regard to maritime security, where um, the Maritime Do Domain Awareness Program of the Quad, which shares information on illegal activities in the Indo-Pacific, will be extended to the Indian Ocean with India's participation uh, to uh, facilitate the absorption of the information and data provided. Uh, there will also be training programs right. and capacity building programs for other countries in the region to actually make the maximum benefit of this maritime domain awareness program. Uh, then you have uh, the decision for a ship observer mission of the Coast Guards and probably this could lead to some kind of joint patrolling in the region. Uh, finally, you would have, uh, you know, uh, a logistics network, a pilot project for joint airlift by the four countries in the to respond more quickly to natural disasters or unforeseen cataclysmic events. Right. So uh, that's an important element of the decisions which have been taken. There's also a decision to look what they call to work uh, for eradicating cancer in the region. Absolutely. And program called the Moonshot Cancer Program, which will initially look at cervical cancer, uh, with India providing $7.5 million worth of screening uh, and vaccinations, screening Fair enough. equipment vaccination so overall some important decisions taken at the quad and an occasion to take stock of where the quad has come how far it has come and to provide directions for the future now if you take a look if it's kamala harris she will continue biden's program as far as the quad is concerned and President Trump, if you go back, mm -hmm. he was the one, it was during his term that the Quad was reactivated and a ministerial meeting of the Quad was held. So I presume he would take ownership and perhaps continue the importance that is attached to the Quad. I think what is helping uh, is the fact that initially when Quad started, it was uh, tentative, primarily because the country's main actors had not yet made up their minds whether they saw China as an opportunity. Let me uh, get in Sriparna at this uh, moment. Sriparna, do you think that the recent meeting that took place uh, and the declaration that really came out more than 5,000 words really, uh, without mentioning China and Russia, really demonstrates a new era uh, and how does it uh, do so? It definitely demonstrates a new era. Even though you know China wasn't mentioned by name, there was a clear-cut um, China focus because um, you know it talked about uh, freedom, uh, free and inclusive Indo-Pacific region where China's aggression is heightened and has been increasing. So even without naming China, when one talks about a free and inclusive Indo-Pacific, it's very clear as to because there's just one country which is increasing its aggression in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, is this of any merit? You know, many years ago when the Quad was coming up, China had called it um, like froth on the ocean, which is going to dissipate with time. But then over the next few years, China went on to call it the Asian NATO. So even China understands that even without saying it or even without naming it, there is a heightened need for like-minded countries to come together because China is proving to be a very difficult challenge. Um, you know, some highlights of this um, Quad meeting go beyond you know just what what has been talked about one thing is that uh, there are these rumblings that mumbai is going to host a quad regional ports and transportation conference in the same year why and how because if we are talking about establishing alternative supply routes it is very pertinent that we start talking about ports if heavens forbid there is a, there is a full blown taiwan straits crisis there is a need to trade through ports which would be outside the affected area. If you look at two countries of the Quad, India and Australia, 
and if you try to understand how much trade happens through ports you will see it's very very minimal that amount of trade um, you know australia has greater port connectivity with china than it has with india so it becomes important that there's a quad regional ports and transportation conference these are all sorts of preparations so which is why i think that this has had um, this was very good which is why there was um, you know so many words which were used 5000 words and that that's why the declaration was so long it's all a preparation for china becoming even more aggressive than it already is so on that note i think um, this this was a uh, successful quad meeting and there should be more such um, discussions and deliberations well there's much more expected on the quad front especially in india when it hosts this next year uh, but getting in swasti at this point in time uh, on the debate uh, dr rao what do you think about the missing element the missing military element uh, in the quad at a time when we are facing two simultaneous wars you've seen of course you yourself perhaps were in poland uh, and uh, ukraine very recently uh, and i have seen of course the negotiations that have been underway uh, to you know on israel and hamas and hezbollah front uh, but yeah. how specifically important and strategic uh, is india hosting quad and what would be the top areas of concern for india in the next uh, one year Right. Good afternoon to you, Aditya. And uh, with respect to the mil missing military component in Quad, I think the first question first, and it requires a bit of clarification as well, which is that Quad was never me really meant to be a military alliance. It is not a military alliance. And also about India's wealth in Chang, which is what is India's foreign policy world to be out there. India has never really believed in alliances. You know, India is not an alliance with any country. India has partnerships and multifaceted partnerships, but not an alliance. So what really Quad stands for, and from an Indian perspective is a collaborative framework for a free open and also let's not forget inclusive indo pacific so right now of course everybody understands that it is really china which is the elephant in the room but china agnosticism will continue because we do not want to play into the hands of china by actually calling or adding uh, the military component to it we don't really believe in court being an asian nato from any stretch of the measure um that's one and the other thing about being more realistic about what God can then do. I think a couple of things. I think um, uh, from India's perspective, there is no, um, the, I, I think there is there is a resilience in India's perspective and also in India's mature uh, approach to understand that, yes, we live in a very complex world. The world is seeing more militarization. You mentioned the case of Ukraine. India's uh, footprint in the, in the war effort, I mean, in the sense that in the mediation effort to bring the war to an end has been growing. You saw that Prime Minister Modi has just met Zelensky uh, three times now in three months that itself shows that you know India's credibility as a player that can finally mediate whenever the time is right for mediation I remember last time speaking to you and saying that right now the time is not right for mediation but whenever the time is right for mediation right. I think India has been very very consistent about its uh, commitment uh, to the fact that this is not an era for war and that you know today's world's problems cannot really be tackled till the time we really bring this uh, bloodshed and this mayhem and murder to, to you know to, to a stop and so so that's one credibility uh, quotient with india the other thing is about also india's bilateral interests etc so uh, what i'm trying to say is that india is aware of the fact that there is bloodshed, there is militarization in the world, and India it's, itself, I mean, if you look at how our own defense ecosystem is uh, progressing, the kind of work that the Ministry of Defense has done in that regard, I think it's pretty commendable. So I personally, th I personally think that there is this wonderful uh, combination that India is right now pursuing, which is that India wants to be uh, diversified in its defense equipment, wants to also be self-reliant in its defense equipment, and of course, it's a, it's a bigger uh, debate out there. But again, at the same time, this is not coming at the cost of what kind of a world view does India have. And if you remember the Prime Minister's remarks, he actually gave a blueprint for that India's uh, Viksit Bharat uh, you know, world view. And he said beautifully that, you know, he gave this metaphor of a push, which basically in English means flower. And he said that this is a blueprint for a Viksit Bharat. And yeah. he said that actually, if you break this down, it stands for a progressive unstoppable skilled and spiritual humanity first and prosperous bharat right so i think this is a kind of a leadership that we require 
coming back to your uh, very important part of your question about court and its uh, missing military component i think there is one thing that we are missing in this particular debate which is the development made on the ipmda i think one of the, th the things that needs to be discussed a little bit more is that whenever we are speaking about a maritime domain uh, or anything that is you know imagined as this key construct in the maritime domain, you know, like for example, the IPMDA, uh, please remember that all kinds of security challenges today, whether it's piracy, whether it's, uh, you know, um, safety of the critical uh, infrastructure like subsea cables, communication cables, etc., all of that actually fall into the purview of hybrid threats. And for tackling those hybrid threats, what you really need is a kind of a real time linking of your information portals between the different kinds of, uh, you know, domain awareness uh, in information collection initiatives, right? So right now, now, India has, has its own, Japan has its own, USA has uh, their own. But when you think of something collaborative like the IPMDA, then you think of, you know, more frameworks to actually cooperate on maritime technology, etc. All of that, all of these initiatives are basically aiming at making the seas more secure, which essentially connects to our original question of how do you actually secure the sea lanes of communication and part right. of which was when I was speaking about. So I think it would be a tad bit, uh, you know, incomplete to say that just because God has a missing overtly military component from its uh, worldview or from its vision, it does not really qualify as a security architecture. I think what we really need to keep in mind is that the kind of security challenges and threats that really uh, mired the Indo-Pacific architecture or meet Indo-Pacific theater, I think Quad is more suited to handle them, okay? As right. long as it is really getting its act together on the IPMTA and its other successive uh, you know, programs. Actually. Fair enough. You know, uh, I want to now move towards the second push that Prime Minister Modi actually gave uh, in that uh, you know summit of the future. And he spoke about the UN reforms. Has it really been a habitual kind of a vicious circle where Ambassador Shankar, you know, we go to the UN, we call for reforms, but nothing really practically happens. Uh, of course, India has said that the summit document for the first time containing a detailed paragraph on Security Council reform is a good beginning. But is this enough? Why do you think that there is continuing hegemony of a few at the United Nations? Or perhaps is that the reason that there are no you, you, you know reforms uh, for instance you know terrorism you can cannot define i mean for the last 25 years you have been sitting on a definition on terrorism and not moving forward so what will eventually bring bring un reforms if at all but at the moment i think everyone recognizes the need for un reform right because the uh, world is beset with multiple crises including the wars in ukraine and gaza the challenge and then challenges which will require cooperation by all countries because they are transboundary in nature, be it climate change, be it global pandemics, be it dealing with terrorism or piracy or the threat of nuclear proliferation. There are a range of challenges which the world confronts. And the UN as it is currently structured has clearly proved uh, unable to actually address these challenges effectively. It has been inadequate. So if you look at the UN, it really reflects the world order as it emerged after the Second World War. So you have uh, three countries, uh, you know, two countries from Europe. And if you include Russia as a European country, then three countries from Europe and the US and then one country, China, uh, from Asia. Mm -hmm. This clear doesn't represent either the economic realities of today, where economic growth has got dispersed around the world and new centers of economic growth have emerged. It doesn't reflect the populations which are dispersed around the world. When you see, you know, a country like India, uh, which has, which is now probably the most populous country in the world, um, is not in the UN. And uh, so you look at the need for restructuring the UN, its procedures, the Security Council, its composition, to better reflect the realities of today. There, I think there is consensus. Where there is no consensus is how do we go about it? And initially, I think uh, India, Brazil, Germany, and Japan 
had put themselves forward as potential, you know, additional members of a reformed uh, Security Council right. in the category. The problem is that there are countries in the neighborhood who oppose, you know, for instance, Argentina opposes Brazil, yeah. uh, China opposes Japan, China opposes India. And as far as India is concerned, individually four of the five permanent members of the Security Council have supported India's candidature, uh, whether it's Russia, whether it's UK, whether it's France, whether it's the US. The one country that has not done so is China. So for India to keep this subject on the agenda, I think is important. Right. And if change does not happen today, it will eventually happen. Of that, I am optimistic. That's a very important point uh, about India setting the narrative really about the UN reforms taking place. Will those text-based negotiations really happen, Dr. Patak? I want to come to you at this point because, you know, over the last two years, uh, you know, we're facing these wars continuously. What has the United Nations really done? Apart from lip service, uh, they should have had a predominant role uh, in peacekeeping, in maintaining, in fact, diplomacy, dialogue that could eventually lead to a conclusion, a peaceful conclusion. But what we see is perhaps UN being a mute spectator, unable to have a mechanism uh, for some kind of a reform. So how do you see this development and the failure of the United Nations? See, the UN has failed at multiple levels. It's not just because it has not included very important members of the international community into the Security Council. It's also because, as you said, it constantly engages in lip service. You know, um, the massacre which happened in Rwanda is a bit old. But again, recently also, UNRWA officials or workers were taking part in the October 7th massacre terrorism in Israel. So the, this reduces the credibility of such organizations. Um, second, it's really not been able to do much to prevent conflicts per se. Also, it picks and chooses conflicts. So there is a need for reform at multiple levels. Unless that happens, and the starting of course has to be by the inclusion of important members, uh, which have been performing economically well, which are, you know, which have leadership roles of the hitherto unlistened to community of the global south, unless they get included, the other things, I don't even know how to enlist them. Then there's a shortage of funding for a lot of UN programs. So UN has been faltering at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. The UN Charter, how many times has it been reformed since you know it was really formed? So, so starting from those small things to the bigger things like UNSC reform, the UN unfortunately at this moment is pretty defunct unless it gets reformed. Um, I don't see it being a very effective international organization to combat newer and emerging challenges. Well, there are much more reforms that are required. In fact, a beginning certainly hasn't been made. Of course, India has made that statement, but a lot more is certainly expected from the United Nations. Uh, I'm sorry I'm you know, out of time right now, but Dr. Swasti, we'll give, uh, you know, bring you again on the debate and debate this further. Thank you very much, Ambassador Meera Shankar. Uh, Dr. Swasti Rao and of course Dr. Sriparna for joining us on the debate. In a horrific incident on September 23rd, Maharashtra's Thane police shot dead Akshay Shinde, who was accused of sexually assaulting two minor girls at a local school in Padlapur town. As per the Thane police, Akshay snatched the gun from cops and opened fire at them. The police, in retaliation, fired at him in self defense. Opposition leaders, meanwhile, including NCP chief Sharad Pawar, have now hit out at the Maharashtra government, calling it an injustice against the victims and demanded an investigation by the sitting High Court judge. The incident brings back memories of December 2019, when in a similar incident, Hyderabad police killed four rape-accused arrested men after police claimed that they tried to snatch their service pistols. In 2023, India saw in total 32,000 rape cases being registered as per the National Crime Records Bureau, with a significant increase in cases in the year 2024. Only about 30% of the rape cases result in a final conviction. The highest number of rape cases have been reported, meanwhile, from Uttar Pradesh, Delhi and Maharashtra. Now, the questions that we are asking here on the News 9 Plus show today. Why have the investigative agencies and judiciary failed to provide speedy justice 
to rape victims. Are political parties deliberately trying to score brownie points using cases of crimes against women? And finally, isn't the killing of rapists in an encounter failure of justice delivery mechanism in the country? Let's debate. Joining me on the show are Rekha Sharma, former chairperson of the National Commission for Women. We also have Dr. Vikram Singh, former DGP of Uttar Pradesh. And of course, Rekha, Rekha Agrawal, advocate, Supreme Court. Mr. Vikram Singh, I want to come to you to understand because you have dealt with such cases. You have spoken and written about it extensively. What will change? You know, I, I cannot begin, you know, asking uh, or thinking where to begin this, really. Because one is a rape case taking place, multiple rape cases taking place. Second is the kind of response mechanism that the investigative agencies or the judiciary really has. There are many cases that are pending for years together. You know, as someone who fought a battle in a rape case, you know, I went to the court in 2006 in the Priyadarshti Mattu case and that br brought in a reform, uh, I must admit. But we had Nirbhaya, we had so many, you know, cases that brought in and shook the conscience of the nation. But now we have a speedy justice mechanism, you know, when the judiciary and the investigative agencies fail, now we have encounters taking place. How justified is this? Adipji, you have put a very, very pertinent question and I would like to split it in just three parts, but less than a minute and a half. Sure. Number one, we have not been able to proceed very fast in the matter and it is even today a quick fix solutions. My learned and very esteemed lawyer, Madam Rekha Agarwalji is here and I would certainly ask her because even for Nirbhaya case, it took more than seven years to get the ends of justice meet. Number two, when the delay happens, that invites corruption, malpractices, hostility of witnesses and tremendous miscarriage of justice. And then the public demand and few of the policemen do succumb to taking shortcuts. And I would not like to believe something akin to fake encounters. Fake encounters can never be the solution. We are living in a society that respects the rule of law and the rule of law is supreme. And the law gives you the power. And there have been cases where conviction has happened within eight days of lodging of the FIR, past records, the best pro prosecutors like Ms. Rekha Agarwalji. And I can assure you, gallows to the person who has committed a gang rape or has committed a murder and rape. Let me assure you of this, make no mistake. But when I dilute the question that when the advocates, when the prosecution compromises with the, the accused, when the witnesses are made to turn hostile, when out of court settlements happen, Adiji, this is an administrative tragedy. This has happened. And we are privy to the fact that this horrible miscarriage of justice is something that is the rule rather than the exception. Now, what can we do? The number of cases that are pending in our courts runs into crores. One incident that happens today will perhaps take decades, if not years, for it to be finalized. Under these circumstances, and the tragedy of the whole rape, and I'm sure you are a very sensitive person, you have fought Miss Muttu's case, you will realize that the rape is just the beginning of the human tragedy, because the rape, as it has said by Justice Krishna Iyer, a murder only kills the body. Rape kills the soul and the family also. Absolutely. The tragedy, the tragedy that begins after that, Adityji, is that it is a torment and a torture for the survivor and the family on a day-to-day -day basis. And the anguish and the agony and the shame in which they have to live and go to court and face absolutely nonsensical and unrelated questions. Well, I will not, I will stop at that. But fake encounters is certainly not the case. I would also say, I would not like to suspect what happened to Vikas Dube in the UP in Kanpur. I would not like to believe and for once that this also Badlapur is a fake encounter till proven otherwise. I would give my discretion to the fact that the police did what they were expected to do. I know it seems impossible and improbable that such a thing could have been possible. But I have seen the world and I have seen the underworld and after being privy to not dozens, but maybe even more than so many encounters. I know everything is possible when the person or the perpetrator or the criminal is a die-hard criminal. He will stop at nothing. Well, he will stop at nothing, but there has been an administrative collapse also. That is the larger debate, uh, as very well put by Dr. Vikram Singh. Uh, Rekha Agrawalji, if I can come to you. As a senior advocate, you know, you have a picture uh, in your mind and you very well can see 
the investigative agencies and the judiciary. Where have we failed? Where have we failed to deliver justice to the victims? Can these encounters that are taking place really set a precedent? Do you think these encounters will bring in a societal mindset change? Do you think these encounters will lessen the burden of crimes of, against women that are taking place in the country? What kind of a reform are we required to have in our administration or system to bring in a change? I would say that whatever Vikram ji has said, in fact, sums up everything that has to be discussed in this uh, in your show today. Uh, failure of justice in a, a given time is the problem that is there in our judicial system, where the victim's family and the society at large loses all faith in the judiciary and in the legal process. Whatever happened in Hyderabad. A few years ago, whatever has happened in the last few days that we're discussing about today. Again, I will reiterate what I said way back in 2019 in one of the shows when Hyderabad killing had come up for the first time that I totally condemn it. The whatever had happened over there as a person who's a part of the judicial system, being an officer of the court and also an Indian citizen who has utmost faith in the constitution of the country. By no stretch of imagination can any person with a, with a head and a heart ever say that these encounters, which may be fake, which may be genuine, whether they can be justified. They may be fake, they may be justified, that time will tell. That is a matter of trial. But ultimately, somewhere or the other, collectively, the judicial system has failed the victim, has failed the society who has lost all faith because as that old maxim goes, justice delayed is justice denied. At the same time, we cannot punish 99 innocent persons. We cannot punish 99 person and let one inno innocent person go scot free. The rule of law says, let an inno innocent person not be punished. He has to, he has a right to ask for a trial and we in a country have got a three-tier system of judiciary of, 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 of a trial. We have the lower court, we have the high court, we have the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court also we have the appeal. After that we got a review petition, we got a curative petition and after that we got a mercy petition to the chief minister or to the president as the case may be. So where have we failed? We have to all pull up our socks. We cannot pinpoint that whether the judiciary has failed whether the legal system, whether the lawyers have failed, whether the public prosecutors have failed, whether the investigating agencies have failed. All I would say over here that we have all failed together. But at the end of the tunnel, there is still light. Nirbhya case took a number of years. People had lost faith in the judiciary. I must say that it became a mockery. So what if Nirbhaya's killers have ultimately been hanged? It took them so many years, seven years, nine years or whatever. It doesn't matter now. The victim's family has probably suffered 10 times more. But yet, I am a firm believer uh, in our judicial system. And I can only hope that somewhere or the other, some mechanism has to be developed. We need more police, sensitive, more sensitization of the police. We need more gender sensitization. We need more education reforms, particularly sex education should be made compulsory in our schools. Right. We need more safer environment at the workplace. We need more laws like POSH and POXO. We need more gender neutral laws. And if collectively we work together, I do not see why justice has to be meted out in a way which only attracts the masses, as I say, it's, a, it's a, like a mass frenzy. Oh, uh, Hyderabad killings, okay, quick justice, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know, that is not what I say. That is not what the Indian judiciary or the Indian constitution talks about. Absolutely, I agree with you when you say that it's been a collective failure. Uh, you know, as someone who has seen this very closely, I can tell you that, you know, it's a multiple failure, not just from the investigative agencies, but from the judiciary, lawyers, from the entire system, to a larger extent because of corruption as well, because of power, because of misuse of power. Uh, I want to come to Dr. Vikram Singh uh, on this point of the collective failure, but also 
uh, about the larger debate of the politics around rapes that also takes place. You know, often we see, as has happened with the RG car case, uh, you know, there are there's, there's politics over, uh, you know, some political parties or forces shielding the rapists or shielding the perpetrators. Then there are others who are trying to milk it to make brownie points out of it. How do you see this uh, kind of a political uh, takeover of the rape cases? What can I say? That nothing shocks and surprises us any longer. The rape, which as Justice Krishna said, is worse than murder. And then we try to extract a pound of flesh for all of us. What is political expediency? It would shame any Indian. And what happened in RG Car Medical College, Kolkata especially. And I can go on and on giving you examples of the grisly manner in which these rapes were exploited. Your rape, my rape, rape in this part of the country, rape in that part. Quoting statistics, absolutely effete and uh, of no consequence at all. What have statistics has got to do? We should realize that the dignity of every single woman is non-negotiable. The day we decide upon this, and yes, whatever be the consequences, I may win or lose, the dignity of every woman is not only sacred, but it will be safeguarded. And to your first question now, who has failed whom? It is a cumulative failure. I have seen the days when any such acquittal happened. They said, let us have an administrative inquiry, what is known as the acquittal report. And the acquittal report mentioned, was it a flawed investigation? Was it bad prosecution? Poor parivy? And almost at that point of time, those professional officers said, bad prosecution, worst investigation that has ended in the acquittal, prepare for an appeal. But first of all, take drastic and exemplary action against the prosecutor who pursued the case and compromised it and made a mess of it. And the investigator who, during the course of investigation, ensured horrible fault lines in the investigation to give maximum advantage to the accused. Mr. Adit, you have been here and all of us have been here for some time. Have you ever heard of an acquittal report or a prosecutor being punished or an investigator being punished? We are so cruel on ourselves that we don't take anything seriously. We dilute even the provisions of the police regulations that this is a mandatory requirement. But we have given the go by why. Either we are unequal to the task or we are also mixed up with the mess up that we have created. My words may be harsh, but we should take a stand. It is now a time to take stand that thus far and no further. And any person who vitiates the investigation, messes up the prosecution, there should be consequences for both. Well, I hope these harsh words uh, actually reach the power corridors, be it of the judiciary, the administration, executive, or the parliament of India. Uh, but last point, uh, you know, last uh, answer from uh, Rekha ji uh, at this uh, stage, you know, where does the buck stop really? You know, we speak about the failure, we admit, and there's a consensus on this panel about a collective failure uh, mechanism, but you know, who will take the final responsibility? Who will actually reform the law? There are questions on police reforms. After Nirbhaya, there was a Justice Verma committee that was set up. A lot of, uh, you know, things were implemented, suggestions were given, but wha what has changed? On ground, I don't see much changing. Of course, a lot of promises being made to victim families, or survivor families in this particular case. But finally, if I can ask you, who is going to change the system? Who is that particular person? Who is that particular chair which will actually deal with such cases and finally bring in that reform? I wish I had the answer, to be honest. I think we all will have to break the change. We all have failed. And we all have to look inside our own selves and uh, as uh, Dr. Vikram Singh just said just now, it is not about winning or losing. Unfortunately, ultimately, it only comes down to statistics. Ultimately, it only comes down to the defense lawyer doing whatever he can, stooping low, as they say, just stooping to conquer, just so that he or she can win the case. So I think that until we all realize our social and moral responsibility it is not just about making a fast buck it is not just about about oh how many cases I have won or how many acquittals that in every criminal lawyer particularly would like to you know or, or tom tom about oh that I've, I've got this person acquitted this murder accused or this rape accused acquitted but there has to be some collective responsibility and there 
has to be they have to be major reforms i hope with the new laws that have that have come up you know with the new uh, right. pns that we have things will change the criminal procedure system will get will change and soon we will have a case which is decided on merit not because of any political pressure or because of any gunda pressure or because of who's who and remember one thing i would like to state over here even a, an accused has a right to a fair trial until he is proved guilty a judicial system is so slow just about 3 weeks back there was a case in mumbai where a man has been finally acquitted right in a rape case after 40 years right and then there are cases where for 40 cases the cases linger on and yet the guilty is not brought to proof absolutely so i think you know, there has to be a balance i agree there has to be a balance but there needs to be in fact a mirror held to those who are accountable mirror held to those who haven't acted and mirror held to those in power who only do lip service in such cases and perhaps use this only for political brownie points but thank you very much dr vikram singh uh, rekha agrawal ji for joining us it was an important debate an important consensus and i hope that the society actually brings in this reform particularly the government judiciary and the investigative agencies care about the re- victims and finally bring in the reforms that are necessary to bring in speedy justice thanks for joining us